Star Wars A New Hope, many of you will remember when it was just Star Wars back in 1977, has just turned 47 years old. I can't believe it. 47 years of the installments that kicked off this amazing franchise. George Lucas is an absolute genius, and today we're going to talk about it. How old were you when you first saw episode 4? And what is your story? The first time, the thunderous opening crawl with John Williams' incredible soundtrack played in the background and you first saw the words, it is a period of civil war. The opening chase sequence, the Star Destroyer, R2-D2 and C-3PO's friendship, the Sandcrawler, Tatooine, the introduction of Luke, not to mention the Cantina aliens, the introduction of the princess, Obi-Wan vs Darth Vader, the throne room, the classic Star Wars movie is jam-packed with fan-favorite moments, which defined not just an era, not just this franchise, but cinematic and sci-fi history. Nothing would ever be the same. George Lucas opened the floodgates. And in recent Disney Star Wars projects, be they movies, TV shows, comics, books, have changed and expanded our understanding of this movie forever. From the way Andor and Rogue One dived into the threat, the scope of the threat, the Empire Wars, from the way Rogue One showed the cost of the Rebellion's first major victory. Then there was the depth given to Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru in the Kenobi show, and the way they gave us more context as to how Leia knew Ben. The way Solo showed us how Han met Chewie, and fleshed out their backstory, to countless other things. Star Wars has always been an evolving story, and the second season of Andor in 2025 is no doubt going to do the same thing. Now before we dive into a wider discussion about this movie, and I'm going to be joined by Diana Lina Santo. I want to talk about some more questionable decisions, ones under the umbrella of Disney Star Wars that affects and alters the way we see Episode 4, and in this case also The Empire Strikes Back. In one of the early Disney Star Wars comics, the first duel between Luke and Darth Vader was not in Episode 5. Instead, it was between the events of A New Hope and Hoth at the beginning of The Empire Strikes Back. Now you might say, well, isn't this reminiscent of Alan Dean Foster's Splinter of the Mind's Eye in 1978? This was technically the first sequel to Star Wars. It's not canon. The Empire Strikes Back hadn't been made yet. And while it was originally commissioned by George Lucas, it is often remembered by the fandom as a fascinating what if. But in the case of the Disney Marvel Star Wars comic, it is canon and created decades after the fact. So it's got a more significant place if you're talking about recent canonicity and does have implications on both episode 4 and 5. So, what is the context? When Marvel regains the Star Wars comic license from Dark Horse, their first publication was a six-issue arc called Skywalker Strikes. The story took place shortly after the destruction of the first Death Star when Han Solo, passing as an emissary of Jabba the Hutt, traveled to the moon Cymoon 1 in the Corellian Industrial Cluster to negotiate the delivery of raw materials for the Imperial Weapons Factory located on that world. He was accompanied by Luke, and Leia, disguised as Han's bodyguards. While Han and Leia were able to make it to the factory's main reactor, Luke discovers some captured slaves and manages to free them. But then, Vader arrives on Cymoon 1. He senses the presence of the person who destroyed the Death Star, but he doesn't know it's Luke, he doesn't know his name, or the fact he's his offspring just yet. Luke ignites his lightsaber. He hears Ben Kenobi's voice, telling him to run. Luke. Listen to me very carefully. Ben? Is that you? Run. Vader enters. You hold that weapon like an untrained child. You have no right to it. You, boy, are no Jedi. Who are you? Luke replies, you killed my father. And this is the bit that's kind of semi-comedic, but also doesn't sound like something Vader would say. I've killed very many fathers. You'll have to be more specific. You know, almost like it's an average Tuesday. Luke immediately slashes for Darth Vader. Vader easily shoves him aside. This is most pathetic. You are not worth the seconds it would take to finish you. Who sent you here to die like this? I was there, Luke says. On the Death Star, I saw what you did to him. You killed Master Kenobi. And then Vader grabs the lightsaber. No. So, Obi-Wan Kenobi gave you this lightsaber. A shame he did not teach you how to wield it. He never did make for much of a master. So Vader is looking at his old lightsaber when he was Anakin. The Force will never be with you, boy. Your master has fallen. What hope have you? If you wish to live, you will tell me all you know of the Rebellion, including the nature of this attack. 
and then you will lead me to the rebel pilot who destroyed the Death Star, and watch as I strike him down. Speak quickly, or join your father. I'd rather die than yield to you, and this is kind of poetic with the way Luke says in The Empire Strikes Back, I'll never join you. So be it. And then Vader gets both lightsabers, both the one he used to have as Anakin, and his lightsaber as Darth Vader. Wait. This lightsaber, I know this weapon. This once belonged to... And in that moment, Han creates a diversion. Had that not happened, this is a fight Luke would obviously have lost. Now, while I'm a fan of a lot of the recent comics, this is one, and I know it's not new, but this is definitely one I'm not a fan of. I think it kind of lessens their meeting in episode 5. It doesn't make sense Luke would confront Vader between those films. So this is one way I think they try to change the canon in a way I disagree. But that being said, my dear friends, as we surpass 47 years of episode 4, here was my conversation with Diana Lina Santo celebrating the first ever Star Wars movie. Enjoy. Well, the first movie I saw was what people now call New Hope. To me, at that time, as a child, it was just called Star Wars. And my father uh, was conducting an international martial arts camp in Aspen, Colorado, which at that time was just sort of a small, kind of calm, quiet town. And there was only one theater and everybody kept talking about Star Wars and pretty much the whole town was heading over to this one theater and it was full to the max. And it was such a beautiful experience because nobody had ever seen that kind of technology. Nobody had ever seen uh, the immersive quality of beautiful music from John Williams and and with these, this incredible special effects and the acting, the writing, the adventure. And by the time the movie was starting to come to its conclusion, it was like a rock concert. So for any of you out there who've been to a Star Wars celebration, it had that spirit people, multi-generations, grandchildren, parents, their, the grand, you know, parents were just jumping out of their seats with joy. They had never seen anything like this. And so I was hooked. And for me, it was amazing to see my father have this amazing curiosity as somebody who specializes in weaponry to start using his imagination about what would it be like to see two lightsabers, you know, uh, in action versus just the solo saber. And I flash forward to my memories of, you know, being with Rosario and being on that bridge on the Mandalorian and seeing her with the two lightsabers. And I just go, oh my gosh, you know, how strange, because I just remember my father, you know, uh, saying, wouldn't it be amazing to see light, two lightsabers in action? And he used to train me for fun because I was a child and, and use, uh, he, he was able to purchase these later on, these plastic extendable lightsabers and train me with them. And, uh, you know, it's just so wild that that was a fun way to, to train me in martial arts. That is the movie, to me, I keep going back to when I want to do a Star Wars rewatch. I always say The Empire Strikes Back is my favourite Star Wars movie, but A New Hope has the innocence I feel that no other film has. And my one of my favourite characters in Star Wars is old Ben, old Obi-Wan, and the, the duel between him and, and Vader and I think this is why when the prequels came out in 1999, everyone was like stunned with the dual lightsaber of Darth Maul, because like you said, no one had ever seen anything other than a single lightsaber. Yeah, yeah, well, very part. Yeah, and he did a great job. Uh, yeah, and, and Alec Guinness was so amazing. And, and actually, uh, I remember he was nominated for Best Supporting Actor for the Oscars, which is unusual to, to see a, a sci-fi film nominated for the Oscars because sometimes they get snubbed, you know, because of its genre. But I say that even Star Wars is art, you know, and it is uh, the uh, pinnacle of the Star Wars. It's what started it all. And and it's amazing what it has been able to trigger all these wonderful Star Wars stories. And and I'm so excited for the future of Star Wars because now they're going much further into different timelines. We're going to see that with Acolyte tomorrow, you know, so this is an exciting time for Star Wars. 